every minute, the world downs roughly 80 million teaspoons of added sugar. That's enough syrup to flood 11 Olympic pools every single day. That habit doesn't just fuel diabetes. Drinking one sugar-sweetened beverage a day links to an 85% higher liver cancer risk in women and can lop almost a year off life expectancy. Skip a single can of soda daily, and most adults can sidestep about 0.5 to 1 kilograms, that's 1 to 2 pounds, of visceral fat each year. That's the kind of fat that drives heart attacks and brain fog. Diabetes already drains 1.3 trillion from the global economy. Supermarket shelves are plastered with zero sugar labels, from cookies to ketchup. But if you grab the wrong packet, your stroke risks can double. Even natural honey isn't a free pass. So whether you're keto, macro counting, chasing longevity, or just trying to keep your kids healthy, mastering sweeteners is mission critical. Today, we're gonna cut through the hype, spotlight the options that can add years to your life, and show you how to reboot your taste buds in just 21 days. I'm Dr. Hilary Lin, Stanford-trained longevity physician. On this channel, I decode frontier science into everyday choices so you can live longer, stronger, and smarter. Stick around and you'll learn not only which sweeteners are the best for you according to science, but also a way to reset that snack voice in your brain. First, let's talk about natural caloric sugars. These are the classics our grandparents knew table sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and natural darlings like honey, maple, coconut sugar. These are delicious, comforting, biologically expensive. A 2023 umbrella review of 3 million people found that each 12 ounce sugary drink boosts all cause mortality by 7 to 10 percent. One can a day for a decade, that's nearly a year shaved off your life expectancy. Plus, a 20-year JAMA cohort of 98,000 women showed that one sugary drink a day raised liver cancer risk by 85% and deaths from chronic liver disease by 68%. We've all heard of fatty liver disease. This causes inflammation, it causes all kinds of issues, and this is just one outcome. So let's talk about something that occurs in both high fructose corn syrup and in a lot of natural sugars, which is fructose. Fructose bypasses your body's glucose speed checks and heads straight to your liver, triggering new fat making, otherwise known as de novo lipogenesis. Triglyceride droplets bloat your liver cells, fats in your blood climb, and uric acid will spike. This all leads to raised blood pressure and gout risk as well. Meanwhile, the excess sugar starves the beneficial gut microbes that make anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acids and feeds the pro-inflammatory strains that leak toxins. It's a little bit like pouring syrup into a car engine. Everything gums up until the pistons seize. The American Health Association caps added sugars at 25 grams a day, so that's about six teaspoons. I would treat that, however, like a speed limit, not a target. I actually think if we were all living the ideal longevity lifestyle, we would have zero grams of added sugar a day. But that's not realistic. Not even I, and I'm pretty diligent, am able to do that. An easy go-to is whole fruit. It's fine because the fiber acts like a traffic cop. It'll slow down the absorption so you're satisfied on fewer grams of sugar. The bottom line is natural caloric sugars are the old guard villains. They're great for your birthdays, but disastrous at high volume and as a daily habit. But what we're all interested in is, are those zero calorie replacements any better? So welcome to the next battlefield. Think of these zero calorie sweeteners as Trojan horses, sweetness without calories, but potential metabolic baggage. Zero sugar does not equal zero risk. The World Health Organization now advises against non-sugar sweeteners for weight loss because the long-term data remain murky. There's a lot of these sweeteners, so we're gonna be tackling each at a time and I'm gonna be marking them uh, according to which to limit and which to minimize. If you're following ideal rules, of course, limit, minimize all of them, but we're trying to be practical here. Artificial sweeteners were designed to give us the joy of sweetness without the metabolic baggage of sugar. Many are up to 200 times sweeter than table sugar and slide through the gut largely unabsorbed. That sounds perfect until you watch how they ricochet through your hormones, your gut bugs, and long-term health markers. Now let's talk for a second about insulin spikes. Insulin spikes happen after glucose spikes, traditionally in the body when we're eating natural sugars. It is the body's signal to store fat. So if you throw that switch and you spike insulin multiple times a day, you get calorie shuffling towards your belly fat, the visceral fat, and then your cells start tuning insulin out 
which paves the road to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease. I bring that up because these zero calorie sweeteners still trigger that response for insulin to go up. And that's why people seemingly paradoxically, because they're zero calories, tend to still build up that visceral fat. So first, let's cover artificial sweeteners. Aspartame. Aspartame is your classic diet soda sweetener. Regulators have set an acceptable daily intake ADI at 40 milligrams per kilograms, but that's 15 cans of diet soda for a 150 pound adult. And yet two years ago, the WHO put it in the group 2B possibly carcinogenic group. Why the caution? It turns out that in the gut, aspartame splits into phenylalanine, aspartic acid, and methanol. And at high doses, methanol turns into formaldehyde, which we all know is not good for a living person. It's better for preserving a corpse. And it's definitely a hit to your DNA. And mechanistically, a dose of aspartame still causes something called a cephalic phase insulin surge. That means just the sweetness hitting your tongue results in an insulin spike and teaches your tissues to ignore insulin over time. So where do you find aspartame? It's in Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Pepsi Zero, Crystal Light, Minute Made Light, Sugar Free Jello. I'm not gonna go out and say eliminate it completely if you're choosing between that and full sugar Coke because the reality is a little bit of Diet Coke is probably still better for you than a ton of full sugar Coke. The verdict is stay within the ADI, but rotate, don't live on it. Next, let's talk sucralose. So sucralose is heat stable, so it sneaks into all of our baked goods and our protein powders. A two week randomized control trial showed that we still get a 20 microunit insulin bump and a 6% dip in our insulin sensitivity with sucralose. And mouse research shows a 50% drop in some good microbiome, such as the bifidobacteria. You can find sucralose in Splenda packets, Starbucks sugar-free syrups, Quest and Atkins bars, Premier Protein Shakes, and Isopure Zero Carb Powders. Like with aspartame, use sucralose sparingly and swap to other options. Luckily, there doesn't seem to be the same link to the potential carcinogenic effects, but still, I would limit it if possible. Next, we have saccharin. What a nice name. The vintage pink packet. So it turns out in mouse studies, we've seen that microbiomes altered by saccharin lead to, or are at least tied to, glucose intolerance. It's very suspicious. And human clamp studies show an insulin bump as well. Not terrible, but I would still use it only occasionally. It's hiding in your sweet and low packets, some retro tab sodas, and some Tarani sugar-free syrups. So keep it to a rare diner coffee for nostalgia's sake. Next, I wanna bring up some with funny names that you might not have heard of. Ace, K, and Neotame. Ultra intense flavors of these sweeteners allow manufacturers to slash the calories, but in rodent megadose trials, they showed thyroid disruption. We don't really have data in humans. I would minimize these just for lack of enough data, frankly. They're hiding in your zero sugar monster and rockstar drinks, vitamin water zero, sugar-free Red Bull, many of those zero sports drinks and assorted protein powders. Overall, artificial sweeteners are rental cars. They're fantastic for a short trip every so often. They're terrible as your forever ride. Next, let's talk about sugar alcohols. Sugar alcohols all end with that all sound. Erythritol, xylitol, sorbitol. They're hybrid molecules, part sugar, part alcohol, but zero buzz. They supply 60 to 80% of sugar sweetness with minimal glucose impact. Dose, however, is destiny. Erythritol, be cautious with this. About 90% of erythritol will leave your body unchanged in the urine. A lot of ketogenic folks really like it. But in a 2023 Nature study, it linked top quartile blood erythritol to two times higher heart attack and stroke risks. The levels also linger in your bodies two to three days post ingestion. It's hiding in a lot of health food aisles. So you might find it in Locanto and Truvia blends, Chobani Zero, Halo Top Keto Pints, Smart Sweets Candies. Save these for special recipes. Again, I would skip these nightly supposed keto pints. So xylitol, you might have seen this in all of your gums. It's been praised for dental health because obviously traditional sugar is terrible for cavities. But if you're somebody who has had more than five gum sticks a day or about 20 grams of xylitol a day, you may have experienced its more unpleasant laxative effects. It's hiding in all of your dental gums like Orbit, Pure and Trident gum, your Sprite toothpaste, and Smart Baking Muffins. Toothpaste is probably fine. You're not eating your toothpaste, but do mind how much you're taking in via chewing gum. 
Sorbitol is another one that you might want to limit a little bit. It's a go-to stabilizer in no sugar added treats. That same around 20 gram threshold triggers gas and diarrhea. It's in your sugar-free gummy bears, diabetic chocolate, and certain ice creams. This one, as with the others, enjoy in kid-sized servings, but don't go overboard. Sugar alcohols are like Teflon coated sugar. Everything slides until you scratch the coating and eat too much and gut chaos ensues. Manufactured non-caloric sweeteners are occasional tools, not staples. Rotate varieties, respect these ADIs and GI limits, and remember when you're chasing sweetness all day, whether it's traditional cane sugar or diet soda, that trains your brain and your palate and your pancreas to follow this hormonal roller coaster. You want to reset your taste buds every month with a bowl of something bitter or plain yogurt. In fact, try to do it every day if possible. It tastes pleasantly neutral. It can help you step off that roller coaster. Now let's talk about the best we currently have. We've defeated the sugar landmines and flagged the Trojan horse substitutes. Let's meet the sweeteners that metabolic scientists actually like with fewer caveats. So think of them as hybrid cars in the sweetness fleet. They're dramatically cleaner than gasoline, but still not a bicycle. First, we have the rare sugars, allulose and tagatose. Rare sugars turn up in trace amounts in figs and raisins, but food chemists can now coax them from cornstarch so they look and taste like sucrose, while your metabolism mostly ignores them. So why are we so intrigued in the scientific world? In a 2024 meta-analysis of 15 randomized control studies, it showed that swapping just two tablespoons of sucrose, that's table sugar, for allulose or tagatose, that cut post-meal glucose by 0.6 millimoles per liter. That's 11 micrograms per deciliter, that's the same boost you'd earn from a brisk 20 minute walk. It's also a bit of an insulin whisperer. So clamp studies, which you don't have to get into, it's the gold standard for measuring insulin responses, show just a five micro unit per milliliter cephalic insulin spike. So that's just background chatter compared to that 20 plus micro unit burst we talked about for sucralose or aspartame. Plus, I was a little worried at first about the effects on the microbiome because frankly, if you eat too much of allulose, you will get a little bloated. But it turns out the studies we have so far seem to suggest that actually allulose might be beneficial for the gut microbiome, which is a total shock to me, honestly. In an, an eight week, 15 gram per day trial, it seemed to bump up acromancia, which is a helpful, positive gut microbiome strain. It thickened the mucus, which is a good thing. And it also lifted butyrate levels, nudging towards that anti-inflammatory gut terrain. Plus, it's good for your teeth. It turns out that cavity-causing streptococcus mutans can't ferment allulose. And if you're counting calories, it turns out per gram, it's 1 20th the amount of calories versus traditional sugar. You're going to find allulose in more and more health foods since we're starting to hear about it more and more in scientific literature. Some of my favorite foods, Magic Spoon cereal, Chobani Zero's yogurt, Quest Hero bars, Chipmunk bakery goods, Chalk Zero's maple syrup. Most keto-friendly chocolate chips will use allulose. There is a little fine print. So like I mentioned, if you have a lot, basically it depends on the person, but about 15 grams per day or more can cause bloating or loose stool. That's simply because it's not being eaten up by most of your other bacteria that live in your gut. And so it's passing straight through and causing that bloat and diarrhea. Also, if you have some rare diseases like hereditary fructose intolerance, you'll want to skip tagatose and introduce allulose only with your doctor's guidance. Also, as an FYI, the U.S. counts allulose as a carb, but not an added sugar. If you see zero gram sugar, that can still be hiding 15 grams of carbs. We still want to look out on the long horizon. We don't have enough long-term data in humans, but so far it's looking pretty good. Now let's talk about natural zero calorie extracts. These are potentially my favorite because because you can make an argument that they activate the same sweet receptors as sugar with virtually no calories and they're very, very natural. So stevia. Stevia's got a funny taste to me, but it truly doesn't seem to have harmful effects. It causes just a minor blip on those clamp studies in insulin, seven micro units. And for the heart and blood pressure, it actually can reduce your blood pressure and improve your fasting glucose levels. However, you'll want to watch your labels because a lot of grocery store packets will dilute stevia with dextrose or erythrocyte or tall. Check your total carbs and look carefully. Stevia can be found in Zevia sodas, Truvia, and Sweet Leaf packets, Oiko's Pro Yogurt, and Starbucks Stevia drops. 
The potential downsides are that the high crude leaf doses can cause a little bit of nausea and bloating for some people, and it does have a mild diuretic effect, which if you have low blood pressure, that might be an issue for you. Now let's talk about monk fruit. I love monk fruit because it's a traditional Asian fruit. It's been cultivated since 13th century by Buddhist monks. Luo Han Guo is the Chinese name and it refers to these monks. Only in the 1990s did spray drying free the ultra sweet magrocytes be useful for export. Human trials seem to show that monk fruit shows flat glucose and insulin, so no spikes, even at industrial doses, which is fantastic. It's labeled grass in the US, meaning generally recognized as safe. In the EU, it should get novel food green lighting soon. Same as with stevia and other types of sweeteners, you might want to watch out for mixes on the label. So while monk fruit itself is fantastic, you might want to make sure it's not being mixed with erythritol or something else to bulk it up for your baking. You want to watch out the GI limits, especially if it's being mixed with allulose. It might be found in your Lakanto baking blends, your Chalk Zero chocolates and syrups, Whole Earth packets, or Health Aid pop sodas. There are rare allergies, but other than that, other than the mixing potentially with Ritol or some other filler, this is a pretty safe sweetener. Stevia and monk fruit are like electric bikes. They're excellent assistants, and if you really crave sweeteners frequently, this might be a good way to healthily get your sugar high. A few caveats and tips and tricks I've learned. Try to cap your sweet events to about three or fewer a day. That can help you control your urges for snacks even more than anything else I've said. A good way to reset, again, is to try something strong but not sugary, like a sour taste, a bitter taste, or spicy taste. That can help you reset your taste buds very quickly. Also, if you're like me, you might want to try using a CGM. That can help you confirm that these sweeteners are keeping your particular glucose levels flat. Rare sugars and plant extracts are today's front runners. They flatten that glucose curve and they barely tickle insulin, and they may even nourish good microbes. But the real unlock isn't just packet swapping, it's shrinking your sweetness threshold so a handful of raspberries feel like dessert. I actually had a friend who did such a good job of this that he said he was dreaming of strawberries and the strawberries were the sweetest thing to him because he was so good at cutting out all other sweeteners. I don't know if I could get there, but you know, inspiration for all of you. Now let's talk about a 21 day palate reset that can help you make this happen. So imagine your taste buds as a volume knob as a stereo. If you've got years of blasting high fructose playlist, cranking that dial to 11, anything less is gonna feel bland. The upside is you can spin that knob back to normal in weeks. It's not quite like hearing damage. The evidence shows that cutting added sugars by 40% for three months made the same vanilla pudding taste 40% sweeter to the intervention group. High sugar versions became cloying. Four week pilots echo the effect. A 150 person Yale randomized control style called the sweet tooth study now recruiting should lock down the exact number of days, but real world coaching clients typically notice fewer cravings by day 14 to 21, which is why I typically tell people try the 21 day reset. So here's how it works. You get a receptor downshift. So sweet taste receptors, T1R2, T1R3, will die down mRNA expression after reduced bombardment from all that sweetness. The fewer receptors you've got, suddenly strawberries pop. Also, you get a brain reward reset. Functional MRI, so scans of your brain, actually show muted dopamine fireworks in the nucleus accumbens after one month of sugar reduction. Your cravings will literally cool off. You also get hormonal harmony. With fewer phantom sweet cues, that cephalic phase, that brain response that triggers your insulin spikes will shrink and that will smooth your energy curve as well. The full 21 reset protocol includes simple steps. Week one, have the number of cans of soda, just take one sugar in your coffee and swap your dessert for fresh fruit or a stevia dash. Week two, break your autopilot. Eliminate your routine sweeteners. Black tea and coffee only. Hydrate with plain or fruit infused water, not highly sweetened sodas. Week three is all about intentional indulgence. Limit to two planned treats per week. For example, a weekend pastry or two squares of 85% dark chocolate. Pause and savor. Mindfulness accelerates receptor recalibration. A quick craving hack is to hit other receptors. So I mentioned the sour and the bitter, which can kind of like cut the craving, but sometimes you don't want sweetness. You want salt or you want umami, like roasted nuts or Parmesan or something pleasantly bitter like matcha or arugula. And that can help you squash those sweet urges via cross-modal inhibition. By day 21, you're gonna get used to black coffee. You won't be reaching for your candy jar and 
your CGM might show fewer spikes overall. It's like dipping blinding overhead lights. At first, everything looks shadowed, but then your eyes recalibrate and suddenly you can see everything clearly without all of that shining, blazing sun above you. Your taste buds will do the same. This shouldn't feel like a life sentence. When you reset your palette in 21 days, you're going to feel good having a healthier palette. So if today's breakdown helped, share it with someone you love, preferably someone you live with, so that the journey will be easier for all of you.